Welcome to Piano Inspires podcast, celebrating pianists, teachers, and innovators as they share their inspiring stories about the transformative power of music. Hello, my name is Andrea McAllister, and I am honored to be sitting here with Dr. Angeline Chang, a Grammy Award winner for Best Instrumental Soloist Performance with Orchestra. Internationally acclaimed pianist Angeline Chang is recognized for her sense of poetry and technical brilliance. Concertizing in Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, North and South America, venues include the Kennedy Center, Kimmel Center in Philadelphia, Carnegie Hall, State Theater in Cleveland, and St. Martin in the Fields in London, just to name a few. As the first artist in residence at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., Angeline developed and launched the Arts for Everyone initiative. She performed at the U.S. Department for State, for the United Nations Women's Organization, and for World AIDS Day in New York for the United Nations before the Secretary General. In addition to being America's first woman pianist awardee, Angeline Chang is also the first pianist of Asian descent to win the Grammy. Dr. Chang is coordinator of keyboard studies, professor of piano, and professor of law at Cleveland State University. That is an impressive list of not just accomplishments, but activism in our fields. What, what brought you to this point? So let's, let's go back to young Angeline, who was growing up in the Midwest. What led you down this path? Well, I think one thing is an insatiable curiosity, perhaps to understand the world and better it however I may. Uh, growing up in what sociologists, sociologists termed uh, one of the most average places in America. Yeah, they did, actually did studies. So it's actually, uh, they referred to such a city as uh, Middletown, USA. And um, they were talking about Muncie, Indiana, where I was born and raised. And I think seeing sort of mid-America, feeling like, oh, this is average. This is great to be average, but what is it like to be beyond this bubble? It felt like pretty much a bubble. Very, very safe, very nurturing place to grow up. Wonderful, wonderful teachers. Wonderful environment, very wholesome. And I think that probably had that worldview um, quest in me in many ways, musically and just um, internationally around the world and how we can, how we're, and I notice in my travels and being with uh, there in various diplomatic circles that we're all at the core, we're all people, we're all human. We have something in common, even though we try to distinguish ourselves, right? And it's, it's all good, but I think at this joint juncture in time, it's great that we're recognizing the commonalities that we have. I mean, yes, we rec understand there are differences, and there's always this type of give and take. Um, and um, yeah, interestingly enough, one of my uh, teachers in Paris had mentioned we sometimes would talk politics, you know, the French. <laughs> Power never stays in one place. And if we remember that, it's like what goes around comes around, that we're all on, on this planet together not separate. I think that's, for me, the big takeaway and something that I feel music helps communicate as well, because it's about the heart, not just about, okay, the technique. As, as we, we have grown up to understand our technique is to enable our voices to be, to be, to be heard so that we can actually make music. It's about the music. Technique is a tool for music. Yes, so and it, as you said, it's a it's a tool for the heart and to express those sentiments that you just spoke of so beautifully. When you were younger, I, I know you said it just it was something that that came to you that that this connection and this this bringing music to the world was just just in you. How did you discover that? Was it something that your parents nurtured, that your community nurtured? How did you find this? Because I would imagine, and we've all experienced this at young ages, 
we don't have that world view, but it seems like this was something that was just bursting out of you. How did that come to be? Mm -hmm. I do think it does have a lot to do with community and family upbringing, for sure, mm -hmm. in many ways. And um, my, my family very much is, is, is like that, very um, uh, always well, having the public service element in mind. And um, I would have to say a lot of this uh, has come, well, I do, my, my father is a political scientist professor, and so that, that wasn't something that I intended to do, but I think there's a lot, lot that, uh, uh, yeah, even through his 90s, he's, he's a professor at Ball State University in Muncie, that's, that's how, uh, and even through his 90s, he's, he's still, you know, being a professor, which is, which is amazing. But it's always this idea of human harmony and world peace. I think that's what it comes down to. And when I was a kid, it's like, well, you know, no problem. Now I'm seeing, mm hmm we have to remind ourselves constantly, constantly about how we can promote that world peace and human harmony. I find your journey to be so interesting because you've had You've had opportunities to bring your music to so many different places and peoples and communities. And so when you uh, left Muncie, take us through the journey of all of mm -hmm. your travels. And you know, I've, because it seems like everywhere you went, this activism and promotion of, of community went with you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's really organic. It's not something that I I set out to do. Like I want to be an activist, even though it's a great thing to recognize that within oneself. I think this conference, especially being at the piano conference, has really <clears throat> highlighted that. Highlighted that yes, we are all activists, and 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 we can be. It's not that oh, it's only a few there, a few that that it belongs to. It's our responsibility to do that. I think in time that that has really helped. Um, to recognize that, recognize, and that it doesn't mean that you have to necessarily <clears throat> be on the streets protesting. Activism, yeah, we can be teachers to do that, help influence and guide and support the next generations, be the best that they can be, and, and really give the community that perhaps we wish we had. And I think that's what really, really said it for me from the very beginning. It's like, well, what do I see missing and what do I wish for the next generation? Yeah, many things, including music. <clears throat> How I may have approached music or <clears throat> was taught music, for example. Uh, oh, well, this really worked well. I really love this. Or this, it's like, well, maybe there's a different approach that could be even better. And I think that's part of it that, that really happened, that really set it. And partially also coming back to where I was in Muncie, it's like, it was very, let's say, plain, vanilla, very average. And I think that that really probably, most likely, set that in motion. Had I, I always thought, well, if I were only in a big, bigger city, but if I were only in a place where there was like so much classical music and you know, big orchestras, I could, I could, you know, great art that we've heard of, you know, some big city or in Europe. And I think that's because I felt like, oh, maybe I was, there's more out there that I did, I did go seek that out. Even in my education, um, when I was at a very early age, I um, somehow in my heart, I felt like, oh, I really love to um, study in Europe. And uh, I was very fortunate because with my father, he needed some help with attending conferences and so we, there was one in Europe and um, my mother he was like oh set to, okay he's going to go with my mother mother's well you know why waste the ticket take your daughter she wants to go to Europe all right so so wonderful wonderful father uh, took me to all the places that we could go with the origins of composers great musicians and visited all around Europe this is before before I even knew some of the composers you know very young age and I just fell in love with it this is 
this is, you know, a lot of the music that, that we were playing, like Beethoven, Mozart, all those, um, were how they grew up, what their house was like, you know, that type of thing, or, or a lot of things. Anyway, so um, for me, that's, that, that uh, really set things in motion, um, that planted that seed. So when I had the opportunity to um, go uh, studied in Europe, I, um, I, I did, I did, and that was a journey in itself as well. But <laughs> so you ended up in Paris. I did, I did. Yes. Before that, I was in Amsterdam for a couple of years, and um, and in Paris for yeah, you know, three, three plus years. Yeah. And uh, where did you study? And I, I, I'm really curious to hear about who you studied with and those experiences. Mm. I was I was really fortunate. Now, um, I uh, studied at the Paris Conservatoire, where the well, the full name back then is a uh, Conservatoire National Supérieur de Musique de Paris, uh, well, de danse et, et de musique, well, dance and music, but um, the Paris Conservatoire. It's the um, uh, the main national conservatory. It's very interesting because the government in France supports uh, the public institutions. The superior schools and the the Paris Conservatory. It was basically a scholarship school, sort of like Curtis, mm -hmm. but not private, but mm -hmm. public. And because of that, um, it was very competitive to get in. Uh, just to give you an idea, there were over three hundred pianists, pianists alone, not just other instruments, auditioning for a handful of spots. And there are several rounds. The audition wasn't like a 10, 20, 30 minute audition. It was more like 10, 20, 30 day audition in several rounds. And, um, and um, well, long story short, uh, I was one of those selected. And when I called home, my parents didn't believe it. So which, which conservatory did you get in? <laughs> it's like, oh. And how old were you when? I was in my teens. I won't specify. <laughs> That's at such a young age to have that that drive and that the stamina to to endure a thirty day audition. That is that takes a lot of willpower and self discipline. Well, looking back, I think so. I think so because I was on my own. My um, I did learn French in school, but it's not the same um, as being there. As one knows, and um, my my parents didn't know anyone in France, and so I was I was on my own, yeah, to to you know find housing to go through mm -hmm. all this process, and I learned a lot. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> yes, and while you were there, you studied with uh, quite a famous composer. I did, I did. Olivier Messiaen and his wife um, Yvonne Loriot Messiaen. She was my piano teacher. And uh, part of the process then was that I ranked really high on the um, on the entrance, so I was able to get my first choice, and she was my first choice, and I was uh, so fortunate. Like hindsight, you know, really is twenty twenty. Never did I even dream that eventually the stars would align, and that it turned out that years later, that his composition was au exotique. By Olivier Messiaen was uh, a piece that uh, I was recognized for in the Grammy, and so for me it was extra special. Of course, it's great to win a Grammy. Of course, well, but, I would imagine so. <laughs> yes, but the the most special part, the more special part, really the most was what it was for and who it was for. It was paying tribute to my teachers, and really, but for the my teachers, yeah. It's like, and, and, and it was interesting because um, when I, you know, you had to go to do those acceptance speeches uh, to get your trophy yeah. <laughs> at the Grammys. Well, I did make mention of that. But, but, but for our, our, uh, our educators, music educators, we wouldn't be where we are today. I mean, I know I wouldn't be here, but, you know, but, but for my teachers. Because my, my family, um, they're not in, in music. I mean, they never made me practice or anything, but it was the joy of music making that really propelled my interest. And you know what? At the Grammys, that got a standing ovation. 
mentioning music educators and and the year after immediately i mean there that took note there's now a music educators award which i'm i'm really i'm really actually so gratified and fulfilled to be part of yeah and in that process so it's it's really for me so fulfilling going full circle in many ways so I know that, of course, winning a Grammy was such a special moment. And as you said, you talk about your the educators who who helped really pave that path for you mm -hmm. to have that opportunity mm -hmm. and how special they were. It's pretty special for you and for all of the pianists and young people looking at you saying, oh, look what she did so not only i feel like you're you're in such gratitude of your teachers but i see your win also as such a role model for the next generation and i don't know if you've had any stories or ways that you've seen that impact of of the next generation or how how your win has 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 changed at least a little piece of the world. Thank you so much for for mentioning that. That's really heartfelt. And I guess I don't necessarily look for those things. I just do what I feel is right. And um, in many ways, I feel that I'm still the same as before. But certainly, my wish is that it helps others as much as possible. And yes, to see that, yes, these are these things are possible. One person can make a difference. One person has made a difference. One person will continue to make that difference. But it's not just that one person. I think it takes the second person to really make that movement happen, to make that forward movement. Um, in the concert, at our opening concert here at the piano conference, I mentioned, like, Transcriptions by it seems like mainstream composers by by a list uh, of Bach, for example, without list championing others, <laughs> there could be. It, it's quite possible that's a different world that we wouldn't have been exposed to the music of not just Bach, Schubert, for example. His works could have been totally lost and unknown, but for some of the championing that uh, list did, beautiful works. Can you imagine a world without? Now, today, it's like how much loss there would have been without, for example. So, yes, championing. But that takes our also our work afterwards, generations after, is to recognize what's so special about that and to make that, bring that out. Bring out what's wonderful about the community, about the art, the music, whatever it is, the richness inside. And, um, yeah, and first to make it available to make it seen, to make it noticed that, yes, these things can happen. And then the community to really help support that. Because um, nowadays, as we recognize, it's, it's not just, OK, somebody telling you, imposing what should be done. But we can really organically feel and then be together and find each other to know, hey, this is really worthwhile. This is something that can really make a difference in so many lives for the better. And music has a powerful way of doing that that I think not many other mediums have. Exactly. And so fortunate to be stewards of that. Mm -hmm. And as you said, maybe the first one, but certainly not the last. Exactly, you got it. And so when you went to, you were uh, the artist in residence at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. And talk to me a little bit about your work there and how you started a movement at the uh, Kennedy Center. Yeah, I'm so gratified but because that was a very long time ago, several decades it seems already. But um, yes, at, back then um, there was not too much going on. I remember when I even entered the Kennedy Center, I was studying at um, the Peabody in Baltimore. And um, one of my reasons for um, going there was um, also location. Um, I really, I, I was performing with um, folks in the Philadelphia Orchestra, an hour away from Baltimore. There are um, 
many things in DC that I was part of that was another hour away. So it was a very great, a great location for me. At the Kennedy Center, even going in, let's say in the middle of the day when there's not, let's say at 8 p.m. the concert time. I remember going in, long corridor, hallway, red carpet, everything, you know, and nothing happening. But then I wanted to just get a program to see what is happening. Um, they're like, excuse me, can I help you? I'm like, what am I doing there? I was like, oh, instead of, oh, welcome. Mm -hmm. This is what's happening. And so that, that struck me, was my, one of my first impressions. But there were people behind the scenes that were trying to make the change, to make it more welcoming so that it's not just seen as an elite institution. Sure, we can be elite, but you can also be welcoming at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so we tried different things. Um, I actually performed there, and that's how I got invited to become the artist in residence. And we're trying to make some changes. Like, well, you know, at that time, it was at the turn of the millennium. Can you imagine that? Okay, it was... I think it was actually before that, but um, that's how we established something called the Millennium Stage. And that name has stuck. Basically, we, tr we um, put stages at the ends of the corridors, mm -hmm. plenty of room, and just saw uh, what could we do to help people. Ah, 6 p.m., we tried several different times, but after work, people did, could avoid rush hour. Great thing. Um, and those who came in early because of parking or traffic or whatnot wouldn't just be standing around for blank stuff. Okay, it serves a purpose for this other audience for, as a pre-concert teaser or get gathering, and um, also free so that anybody would be welcome to just go up that long hill uh, and enter the Kennedy Center, feel welcome that they don't have to purchase a ticket in order to enjoy and be, experience the arts. And I'm so proud that this wasn't just a one-time thing, but it's be institutionalized as 365 days of the year thing, 6 p.m. If you don't have anything that you, you know, you go to D.C. and you're like, what can I do? Well, and you're on a budget, or even if you're not on a budget, there's something there. And I feel so, 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 so fulfilled that that is something that's lasted. That's wonderful that you've established that, that connection with the community that clearly was lacking before. I mean, if you felt like you were an intruder, <laughs> we shouldn't feel that when it comes to music. And, and you recognize that you made that change. And, and like you were saying, you know, it was one person who said, wait, why, why is this the, the welcome I'm receiving when we could welcome people with music? And it has lasted all these years, 365 days <laughs> a year. That's just amazing. Um, now, I'm interested from Kennedy Center to uh, your work with so many different organizations. Uh, United Nations was one of many that was listed. Um, was this a route through the Kennedy Center that you, you came to these other organizations? How, how, are, how are you getting involved with these other organizations that are helping to promote change and unity in the world? Mm. Well, it seems like sometimes it feels like it's all disconnected. Sometimes it, then you think, oh, it is actually very connected. Um, so, well, I also did programs at the Depart U.S. Department of State, the State Department, and and I think somehow it all sort of fit together in many ways. It's like, ah, yes, there's this other program that that um, that is of interest, and um, certainly um, playing for the benefit of the United Nations Women's Organization. Yes, definitely, and and um, that was something else too to to go to uh, to Nepal for the very first time. It was such a very spiritual place. It was amazing. And um, I remember also being sh treated so well, like royalty. You know, I played for royalty back then. And, um, you know, chauffeured and just you know, first class, you know, everything. And um, essentially having an entourage all the time. I thought, you know, I would really like to understand and get a sense of 
what's really there, meaning like not just what we see as presented to us, but you know, even something like a local dish, a food mm -hmm. or something, or a local, something that's local. But I was surrounded and I could see, and I felt well protected, it was wonderful. Go to visit these different sites and just hidden umbrellas, parasols, beeline, like peeking out. And I see, what are we trying to hide ourselves? Or they're very thoughtful in hiding me, but um, what are we trying to hide from? I see out there in the plaza, folks, it seemed like tattered, because um, back then too, was Nepal was among the poorest countries in the world, monetarily, okay? Um, and I see people just lying in the plaza. Yeah, their clothes are a little tattered, but uh, I'm just lying down enjoying sunshine, life, everything. I was wondering, so who are the rich people, really? That's how I felt. I felt, that's richness. You have the world right there. You're enjoying life. None of this hiding. And that hit me. That really hit me. So uh, I think all of your your experiences and your your vision of the world and how it how we could be and how we can connect with one another it really just comes out in your playing. Oh. Thank you. And. I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious as you are, you know, you're preparing for a performance or when you go on stage, I know there, we have to think about the notes and the technique and, you know, what are your thoughts on stage when you're with your, when you're with an audience? How do you, how do you transform and make us feel so much? Well, it takes one to feel that and it reminds me of a time period when I was at Indiana University and my teacher was Menachem Pressler. I, um, at that time, I was trying to figure out my course schedule. There's so many wonderful courses at IU. <laughs> should I take Shankarian analysis? Should I take advanced theory? Take, what, what theory class should I take to better my piano playing? Hmm? <laughs> to understand, you know, the repertoire. And you know what Mr. Pressler told me? And I thought, you know, this the strangest thing. I, I try not to tell theorists, but sometimes I do. But he said, my dear Angeline, it doesn't matter what you take. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Like, what? Oh, Angeline, it doesn't matter what you take. You must feel the music. And to me, yeah, it, it seems like, well, you know, if you know Mr. Plesha, you understand. And I understood. Oh. It's how you apply, how you implement, how you relate. Not just the facts, not just the, not just the technique you could mention as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 you know, it seems like when we look backwards um, and mention like the stars aligning in many ways, hindsight is twenty twenty. that resonation, those things that resonate with one. I understood that right away. It's like, oh yeah, okay. I'll just take Shankar analysis. No, <laughs> no, no. But it's like you know, it's like, like I'd mentioned. Sometimes it goes right past us. Like that, I felt that also. I understood, and sometimes those signs help us help shape us to know who we are, not just somebody telling you what you should do but really feeling. And that, I think, also translates to the performance as well. It's, sure, we work so hard to make it look like there's nothing to it. And the reason that we do that is so that we can transmit that message. And for me, it's about that message, not like, okay, I'm telling you this is the message. But what is that that transcends, that what is music about? It's It goes beyond words. It really does. It's it's For me, it's where... what. And we all know this. It can really speak for the heart what words cannot do, right? And so if we avoid that, then it sounds like we're avoiding that. 
And for me, it's that's what it's about. And that's what I like to relate because, um, and it, it, for the longest time, I felt that from a very, very young age, and I felt very different. Like, I thought, well, that's partly why um, when I went to Europe, that really resonated with me, the type of education and uh, understanding, the cultural understanding of the depth of what's, what's, what's there. Um, at that time, I felt like other places that I was entertaining were at least what I saw there is a trend for playing fast and loud, competition playing. And that mm -hmm. was rewarded. And certainly that's it's really fascinating to see that. But for me, that didn't really resonate with me. The competition aspect of, okay, you know. And so um, I was always surprised if somebody could relate to what I was doing. So I thought, well, you know, I'll learn to play fast and loud. But really what I'm like wanting to do is something from the heart and I was always surprised that people could feel if they did feel anything sometimes they don't but when they do it's like wow you understood what I was yeah, mm -hmm. getting at wow and I felt that so much being here at the, at the conference it's like wow you understood that cool <laughs> but it was very clear at the concert that the audience felt that from you oh. and there there was an energy and an emotion in the room that that like you said you can't put words to but you felt it you definitely felt it uh, I know we've talked a lot about you know, uh, music in the world and how we can make a change I want to look forward now mm -hmm. and we're at this time where there is a lot of division and uh, there is a lot of disagreement, and um, we're just, there's a lot of tension in many places. Fortunately, we're experiencing the opposite of that this <laughs> week in this environment that we're currently in, um, as we are all surrounded by pianists and teachers, and, and we're feeling it. How do we carry this out into the world? What does it look like? Let's say, you know, if we fast forward 10 years, and say, how has music transformed the world? How can we take this message out and really make a difference? I know we might think that, well, just in my small little community, I can do a little bit, but yeah, how does that change the world? Yeah, planting the seeds does change the world. And for me, I think the message is also understanding that the arts, music, is for everyone. I mean, a lot of times we're talking about classical music, highbrow music, but it's, where did it originate? It wasn't highbrow. We made it highbrow, so to speak. Nothing wrong with highbrow or lowbrow or mediumbrow, you know? It's, it's, it's for everyone. And that's one of the things I learned at the Grammys, too, because when I was nominated, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a fish out of water here being a classical <laughs> musician, because all I knew was what was I saw on primetime TV. But even then... Going there, it was it was a community. Mutual respect all around for all genres. It wasn't, oh, because you're not pop, you're not like, hip. It wasn't that at all. It's just that, you know, primetime TV, there's just a small segment of what they could, you know, make money off of. But anyway, <laughs> right. No, no, nothing wrong with that because those type of things would help fund mm -hmm. things that were, you know, may... We need some more support. Mm -hmm. And did you know that the Grammys is actually the largest fundraiser for all their activities, including a lot of great programs that help musicians in need, for example. So that's fabulous. Yeah. And we don't see that. And not until I won did I even know about some of these programs that were like behind the scenes, like, oh my gosh, there's so much more. Just like there's so much more here in our conference. Each individual brings so much, but um, you know, the organizational part to institute what we value in that sense that help the next generation. Now, with all the division and all that, I think partly it's because there's not this type of communication and understanding. And so there's a, the tendency for us to just be in our group that we feel safe and secure and everything else out there is like, mm, no, no, don't touch that. Whereas I feel it's the opposite that needs to happen. For example, when I went to Nepal, and it's like, okay, I'm very comfortable, you know, in this uh, 
at uh, this wonderful palace of a hotel and everything like this. And but yeah, it's going beyond and actually noticing those things and to be, hey, these are these are humans. These are we we can interact. We we have something to benefit each other that can help make things better, or an understanding. It's not that you have to agree with the others, but at least understand or at least communicate. You can agree to disagree and still still understand and um, <clears throat> and uh, and have that common goal of making something for the better. Now, you know we can decide like, okay, we'll try your way this time. Try your that our way that time and see okay then objective and i know it's really difficult because it's there's a lot of times people don't want to see that and i think part of it is taking off those blinders and just being open even if you disagree with something like how many times have you gone to a concert and say oh i wouldn't do it that way i wouldn't do that <laughs> but you can't deny that whatever they gave was like wow they worked on that. They made it special. They made it their own. And that's what makes the world turn. Having all this, uh, embracing our uniqueness in that sense. And it's, it's great that we're all different, but we're all the same at the same time. Understanding that. At the core, there's certain things that we all want and that we all need. That feeling of security. There are a lot of people here, when we're changing the status quo, feel very insecure. It's not that necessarily i think that they're uh feeling that um you know uh they're in the right we're in the wrong or just they're just wanting to hold power they're, they're, folks might lash out because they feel insecure not because they feel powerful and i think it's very important to understand some of the signs that we might interpret aren't necessarily what's really going on and see what we can all do to have that mutual understanding for world peace and human harmony. <laughs> right, just a small, just a small little thing. We, we as musicians can, yeah, I say it kind of facetiously, but seriously, yeah. that music can do that. Absolutely. And you are proving that day in and day out. And we really thank you for all the work you have done and are doing at some to create that place that we all hope we can get to someday, but we're also in it now. We are in we're it now. also seeing how it's happening. It's happening. It and is happening. Music is is that connector. Absolutely. And it's just beautiful. Um, well, thank you so much. I do want to end with one question mm -hmm. because this is the Piano Inspires podcast. So uh, I'm sure we have. Uh, I think this will be a good way to bring it, all of these conversations together because it's just been a, a transformative conversation. I am uplifted. I want to go out and just just do good for the world right now, which I know we Yay. are all doing through music. <laughs> but um, so if how does piano inspire? How do we take piano? How does that inspire? It's a great question. And for me, Piano, it represents all the, the whole range of an orchestra. We have 88 keys. We can see them. It's all out there. And they can all create harmony. There's dissonance there. There's everything. It's the world. It's the world. I think it's one of the reasons that I uh, went towards piano versus another instrument. Growing up, there are a lot of different instruments that I was fortunate to experience. But the piano, that stuff because I do feel that it represents the world. And if the piano can be in harmony, we can make harmony. We can make harmony out there as well. So that's how, for me, piano inspires reflection of how we can coexist together, make different things, combinations of beautiful creations happen. We can also express that, uh, that angst that we all, uh, all might experience. There's dissonance. There's resolution. There's everything there. And it's how we make it. It's what we do with it that counts. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Angeline, for sitting down and talking with me today. Thank you, Andy. My great pleasure. 
The Francis Clark Center is a not-for-profit educational organization that serves the advancement of piano teaching, learning, and performing. Divisions include Piano Magazine, Piano Inspires Kids, Journal for Piano Research, National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy, the New School for Music Study, Piano Education Press, International Online Teacher Education, and Piano Inspires Online Community Hub. Please visit us at pianoinspires.com to learn more about our impactful work and inspiring community.